Well, hi. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new term at the History of Gardens and Landscape Seminar. I'm Pippa Potts, um, one of the conveners, but it might seem as I'm masquerading as Michael Ann Mullen this evening because of the names on the boxes. Um, as many of you will know, the seminar has just produced its first ever publication. It's called Conversations in Garden History, and it's available on Amazon. So do please go and have a look. Um, the book's a collection of papers which we selected to highlight the way that garden history draws from and contributes to studies in other disciplines. And this term's programme, Roots and Roots, sort of spins out from there with presentations which have a very strong interdisciplinary nature. Uh, so before I introduce the first presentation and the first speaker, can I remind you please to turn off your videos and mute yourselves? Also, please do write your comments and questions in the chat box, and they'll be relayed to the speaker at the end of the presentation um, by Shahrazad van der Zijden, one of the conveners. Um, and this evening, if you'd rather, you, if you feel you'd rather do it this way, you're welcome to put your video on and unmute yourself and ask your question directly, or you could type in your in the in the chat box and tell Shahrazad that that's what you'd like to do. So let's let's try that this evening. So finally, to the speaker herself, and I'm really delighted to welcome Elizabeth Stewart, whose work shows how technology can intersect with garden history to bring a better and broader understanding of historic sites. Elizabeth is currently a geotechnical engineer working with the Harrison Group, who are among the UK's leading geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers. I said that would be difficult to say. She has a strong experience, a broad experience of heritage, archaeology and museum, Hello. and a strong background in landscape Hello. history with a PhD and MA from the University of East Anglia. Her PhD was entitled Prospects and Promenades using 3D and GIS to recreate contemporary visual experiences with English design, within English design landscapes from six, about 1550 to 1660. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to be given a fascinating tour of some of those prospects and promenades um, seen through the lens of three-dimensional geographical information systems, 3D GIS. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so a bit more about myself. So I passed my PhD in 2019 and I did my MA between 2014 and 2015, um, but my MA kind of inspired my PhD. They're roughly in the same ballpark. So for my MA, I focused on Norfolk and my MA was very much a self-taught, learn as you go, see how it works sort of situation. And then for my PhD, I wanted to up the ante and I got some training and some different 3D modeling software to make them just a little bit better, more comprehensive results. Um, unfortunately, due to accessibility issues, I can't show what I did for my MA in terms of results, but I'll prioritize what I did for my PhD. Um, so hopefully through this talk, I'll provide a bit of insight into how a 3D GIS approach could open up research possibilities of not only English design landscapes from 1550 to 1660, but other gardens and landscapes from different countries, different time periods, or whatever subject area you think uh, could benefit from it. So first I'll clarify what I mean by English design landscapes in 1550 to 1660. So these landscapes typically comprised of a country house surrounded by various gardens and service yards that then expanded into areas of parkland and likely incorporated a wider estate landscape including villages, churches, fields, woodlands, and more. So these landscapes were owned by the elite among societies, so those who had the financial and physical means to create, demolish, and redesign these landscapes. So because these landscapes were ultimately owned and overseen by a single landowning family, these estates were considered a collective entity and in many cases spanned tens of thousands of acres. So it makes it very hard to understand each of the features individually, despite their being used for individual purpose, without acknowledging all other aspects of the estate. 
So not only did each feature within design and landscapes greatly influence how the estate grew and developed, but it also came down to the individuality of the landowners who created or redeveloped them. So their tastes, their needs, their dreams, their dislikes would all be represented within the landscapes they primarily owned and lived within. As a result, these landscapes provide one of the few opportunities to reveal and interpret the perspective of a particular individual or family and their attitude towards the landscape. So when I'm talking about the periods 1550 to 1660, I'm addressing a period that encompasses what garden historian Roy Strong has dubbed the age of adventure and the age of display. So we see a move away from the medieval period, which has quite enclosed and static landscapes with limited scope for movement. Some aspects of the medieval period still seeps into the landscapes during Henry VIII's reign, such as heraldic symbolism, as demonstrated in this painting of Whitehall Palace. And that still remained popular as it evoked this sense of ancestry and status connected with establishing a family, familial lineage. However, in the 16th and 17th centuries, things started to change. Sparked by the discovery of the new world under Elizabeth I, there became this growing desire for people to actively engage with the landscape through exploration or adventure. And this featured heavily in English design landscapes, whether they sought to find beauty and entertainment or privacy and seclusion. At the same time, these landscapes became the ultimate display of various designs and impressive features inspired by primarily European fashions, such as French parterres or Italianate sculpture. But of course, as is the feature of my research, the landowners who created them very much encouraged anyone who resided or visited there, whether it be guests, royalty, or just themselves and their families, to venture out into the estate and experience the landscape for themselves. So I chose the 16th and 17th centuries in particular because it is considered to be an under-researched era of landscape design across many disciplines. The main reason for this is the lack of primary sources that provide an idea of how these landscapes looked, let alone what was experienced within them. This is additionally hindered by the real scarcity of surviving, let alone accessible design landscapes from this period still present in the landscape today. Attempts have been made to reconstruct these sites in situ within the landscape, like this garden at Kenilworth Castle. However, despite its beauty, this was achieved by labour intensive, expensive, but also invasive means that, if done incorrectly, could actually damage the archaeology of the site. So as a result, this technique is generally a non-viable option to repeat and implement at other sites. In the majority of cases, these landscapes also tend to remain in the landscape, but altered kind of beyond recognition during the 18th and 19th centuries by landscape designers like Lancelot Capability Brown, who redesigned Audley End with the landscape park in the 18th century. And then there was an additional era in the 19th century with the picturesque by Humphrey Rempton. So because a greater number of design landscapes from the 18th and 19th centuries tend to survive more intact, that leaves the 16th and 17th centuries a far less popular period of study. So this is why I feel that 3D GIS can provide the greatest benefit for the 16th and 17th centuries. So by providing a non-invasive technique of visualizing these landscapes within its original landscape context, 3D GIS ultimately provides this period of history with an additional resource as a substitute for a surviving site, which I hope will then boost future research into these places and brings the level of analysis to a new level to help compete with these later periods of landscape design. So my work was focusing on how people visually experience these landscapes. So although some written extracts exist, it is ugh, extremely rare to find documentary evidence of contemporaries from this period describing what they perceive of a particular landscape in their own words. A purpose of undertaking this, this research was to try and interpret what those thoughts and feelings could have potentially been and to subsequently provide new insight into who the landowners were in terms of their personalities. So neurophysiologically speaking, sight is considered to be our most dominant sense. 
So experiences naturally are prioritized through sight, and these landscapes were certainly designed to be seen and experienced visually. So in this period, popular concepts of geometry, including symmetry, order, and proportion, were being incorporated into landscape design that alone became visually dominating. Uh, geometry also addresses lines of perspective, the visual connection between two points as visualized by de Vries's sketch here. As Henry Wooten, an uh, architectural theorist, described, the prospect or landscape view not only is concerned with what you can and cannot see, but must contain certain properties in order to feed and satisfy the spectator. No single estate, however, contained the same properties and landscape compositions of another. And so each landowner uniquely manipulated their landscapes to satisfy their spectators with what properties they individually had and could be achieved with their own means. And so landowners created particular locations with such prospects, whether it be in the main country house to external buildings and other landscape features within the estate. But the prospect did not have to be enjoyed from a stationary position, but also by moving through the landscape as enacted by Van Leyden's The Promenade. So a promenade was primarily experienced in the form of walks through the landscape, but I have also extended this interpretation in my research to include the arrival of guests along the approach or the entranceway into the estate. So my research therefore focuses on these acts of prospect, promenade and perspective that I have recreated and analysed at specific sites using 3D GIS. So my aim is to help establish how these landscapes were experienced, why they were experienced in that way, and whether these landowners wanted to highlight or obscure particular features from view and what that can collectively reveal about the kind of people these landowners were. So before delving into the methodology and results, I'll tell you about the sites that I chose for my master's and PhD. And the reason that I chose them was a combination of the site uh, condition it is in today, um, how accessible it is to the public, the status of the landowners who lived there, and what primary sources were available about them so that I could address a variety of different scenarios and see how effective a 3D GIS approach could be for each of them. So for my master's dissertation, which I focused on Norfolk, I looked at Blickling Hall, Hunstanton Hall and Riston Hall. So Blickling Hall is a renowned National Trust property with a surviving yet refurbished Tudor, Tudor house. The gardens and the parkland beyond have been altered, but some architectural drawings and cartographic sources and other written documents provide an idea of what it was like. And Blickling was owned by the Hobart family who had connections to Henry VIII, so fairly high, high up in society. Hunstanton Hall is a medieval moated residence that partially survives but is privately owned today. Some 17th century outbuildings and a medieval deer park exist still, and there are some maps and documents from the period, um, but it was owned by the Lestrange family who came from old money and were highly respected among the local gentry. And finally, Riston Hall, uh, a 17th century estate that no longer exists in any shape or form. All that survives is a single painting and a couple of maps, but it was owned by Sir Roger Pratt, who came from new money and was a gentleman architect who wrote some texts and even designed houses himself, which provided quite a rare chance to see first-hand accounts of what he personally thought about landscapes. And then for my PhD, I expanded into the rest of East Anglia. So I looked at Stiffkey Old Hall in Norfolk, which is partially demolished, privately owned, and still has some elements of its original landscape design surviving. There is a map and engraving, as well as some estate accounts to work from, but this is a much smaller and confined estate than most because it was owned by a lower ranking individual called Sir Nathaniel Bacon, who is the second son of Sir Nicholas Bacon. Then Hoxon Hall in Suffolk, completely demolished today. The land is now privately owned, but you can still see the bare bones of the park and estate still surviving. This was a reclaimed bishop's palace that turned into a country house for the Southwell family, and it was their second home, not their main residence. So only a map from this period survives. And finally, Morsham Hall, 
Not only was it completely demolished, but the entire landscape has now been built over by the suburbs of Chelmsford. So very limited information exists. There is a map and an engraving. There was also an archaeological excavation. It was owned by the Mildemay family, or Mildmay family, um, who are one of the wealthiest families in the country who even hosted royalty. So each site has certain strengths and weaknesses, provides a different set of challenges, and I felt that it would be interesting to see how 3D GIS could help enhance research into each of them. So now I've kind of set the scene, um, I'll move on to a brief look at the methodology. So first I did adopt a regional approach looking at Norfolk and then East Anglia. But before selecting the sites, I did some 2D GIS analyses combined with statistical analyses to work out the distribution of sites in East Anglia and whether there are any correlations between the locations compared to topography, geology, rivers, neighboring estates. I won't go into the results today because that will be a whole other talk entirely. Um, but this research did provide some enlightening information about where estates tended to reside and what likely influenced the landowner's decision to create or maintain them there. So after compiling this data, um, it was necessary to establish which sites could actually be a viable option to undertake a 3D GIS recreation of. So the map on the left uh, shows coverage of topographical data in the form of a DTM or digital terrain model using LIDAR, which is from my PhD thesis. So we need topographical data not only to build the site upon, but also to establish a wider landscape context that could still affect how these design landscapes were experienced. So the circles are buffers providing data within a two mile radius, which proved a satisfactory area to work with. So out of the 1,300 plus sites in my data set, um, only 300 or less than 300 met this actual requirement. There has been a boost in LIDAR coverage since, uh, so these circumstances may have changed. Um, in the case of Stiff Key, um, that two mile radius actually exceeded its requirements. So there's a tool called a horizon tool in ArcGIS, which established from a viewpoint in the center where the main residence is, um, the estate is kind of situated within a valley. So the maximum viewing extent actually fell well within a one mile radius. Um, so two miles seemed a bit excessive, um, but it just goes to show how much topography can actually affect uh, what is visible within a landscape and what could actually be perceived. So then it's time to compile the data um, and work out the layout of the estate and the wider landscape. So I've primarily adopted a landscape history approach, one that's quite multidisciplinary. So I've used various sources, different mediums uh, to provide information to assist this process. And of course, there are various strengths and weaknesses with each of them. So it's necessary to try and address and incorporate each of them. So artistic works are useful. So paintings, engravings, and even maps all depict what design landscapes were once like through the eyes of contemporary. Um, they do come in varying degrees of detail, whether that's an intricate sketch of the banqueting house at Blickling to more simple yet wider landscape context captured on maps like Morsham Hall. Um, however, they should be taken with a pinch of salt because some paintings will depict ideal or imagined landscapes that bear no true resemblance to re landscapes in reality. Nonetheless, we are still in, although we are interested in what the estates looked like for this part of the methodology, we, stu we do still wish to investigate such works that could hint at what landowners themselves liked to get an idea of their personalities. Um, and then the Mild Mild Maze, Mild Maze Family Memorial Monument in Chelmsford Parish Church includes some of their heraldry displayed with vibrant colors and ornate decorations that shows what their aesthetic tastes were as well. Also, there is no need to limit research to the site that's just being analyzed as there are other places in the country that these families owned and left their mark on. 
So, for example, the Bacon family at Stiffkey Old Hall had their main residence at Old Gorhambury in Hertfordshire, which actually bears some resemblance to what Stiffkey looked like, and so it's worth considering all these avenues. Um, then we have architectural and garden history. Um, two different approaches, yet both are quite intertwined, and it's difficult to consider the house without considering the gardens. So both architectural and garden history use texts and plans to explore and understand these places individually, but experiences within them can tend to be limited to either within the country house or the gardens. However, the spatial arrangement of, wide, of the wider estate tends to be absent from these analyses. Um, however, in the case of Blickling Hall, it becomes clear that both should be considered together. So in the ceiling of the gallery within Blickling Hall, um, the uh, plaster work contains extracts from a literary text called Minerva Britannica. Um, these intricate designs on the ceiling also bear resemblance to parterre garden designs at the time. So it is plausible to assume that these ceiling designs were also mimicked in the parterre designs visible directly beneath the gallery at Blitling. I've also addressed some archaeological sources. Um, and some design landscapes do have remains that can be observed. So I did undertake a GPS survey of the grounds at Blickling to identify any contemporary landscape features to record the locations of. I also experimented with some photogrammetry of surviving sculptures, such as the fountain at Blickling that once belonged to Oxnead Hall and the statue of Hercules, um, which I could then incorporate into the models later. Also, the LIDAR data itself can help pick out features, such as the outline of the moat surrounding the Octagon uh, Banqueting House at Hunstanton Hall. Beyond the immediate estate, there are also remains in the wider landscape worth including, such as these remains of medieval tofts and crofts, which are essentially housing, uh, that can be seen on aerial photography and LIDAR. So after compiling all the data available, I extracted all the data within GIS, uh, which helped to synthesize, compare, and rationalize all the evidence, combine all the different historiographical approaches mentioned earlier, and ultimately create one cohesive interpretation of an individual design landscape, which as a whole roughly encompasses about 8,000 acres per site, uh, 4,000 for stiff key, which was smaller. Um, but since some estates could span up to 10,000 acres, this certainly provided enough landscape data to work with initially. So each of the shapes are called polygons saved into individual shape files according to the kind of landscape feature they represent. So there's a shape file for fields, one for hedgerows, one for trees, etc. Um, so these polygons have been traced down to the individual tree and hedgerow that I could find. Um, each shapefile is then stored within a geo database, which keeps everything together. And then the shapefiles contain their own attribute tables, which can then be used to store a record of all the sources used to support them. So this is the 2D GIS environment completed. So then it's necessary to use the data in 3D environment, because when it comes to perceiving the landscape from the eyes of a contemporary, it would not be realistic to do it from a 2D perspective. And this is where the LIDAR topographical data from earlier becomes important. So the first thing is landscapes aren't flat. We cannot rely on landscape paintings either because they are potentially distorting the natural topography in their depictions. However, one issue is our current topography uh, doesn't necessarily reflect the topography of the 16th and 17th centuries. So in the top left-hand corner is the original LiDAR data download for Malsham Hall. And as you can see, there is a great big motorway overpass cutting right through the data, which is really annoying and definitely did not exist. So it is possible to edit out the data and smooth the contours to remove them, as seen in the top right-hand corner. Um, it is a bit time consuming, but it is doable. And as a result, we have something more closely resembling uh, the time period and we can then build our data on top of that. But then for the visual analysis later, we will need to create, create a separate data set called a DSM or a digital surface model 
It is essentially a DTM, but with the surface features added, like the buildings and trees. Um, as we can see from the bottom left corner, uh, we can't use the current DSM at Motion because it is completely built over by the suburbs. So from the shape files that we created earlier, each of the polygons representing both artificial and natural features from that period have all been assigned height data and then converting the polygons into raster data, which is the same data type as the LiDAR data. These contemporary features can be merged into the DTM to create a DSM in the bottom right hand corner. So now we can work on the actual 3D GIS environment. So this is Hoxon Hall. And this is how the polygons we've already created look like in 3D using a basic extrusion technique. And it's fine. You can see the locations of features. You can navigate around. However, there are more descriptive and detailed pieces of evidence which contain information about color schemes, building materials, particular styles and designs. And it's just something that these polygons just can't replicate. Um, so in ArcGIS, a data format called a multi-patch allows the importation of data from external CAD software where we can create more realistic 3D models to include in the 3D GIS world. So this was the level that I started at with my master's degree. Um, I used Trimble SketchUp, which was a cheap license to use at a time. It was I was self-taught, very simple, user-friendly interface. And this was my recreation of the banqueting hall at uh, Blickling. Um, with a bit more training, I probably could have done a bit better with the statues on the columns, for example. Um, but when it came to my PhD, I wanted to explore other software to improve my skills and make something look a bit more accomplished. So I then used 3D S Max, which was developed by Autodesk and has been used by game designers and has a strong partnership with Esri, who developed ArcGIS, which is the GIS software I'm using. So it is far more complicated and I was fortunate enough to receive training in it, but I feel that the outcome is much better than uh, what I could achieve with SketchUp on my own. Um, so in the case of both SketchUp and 3D, uh, 3DS Max, uh, the polygons created, um, we can then extract the topographical data based on the boundaries of the polygons and then build the models on top of them, which is this light blue highlighted bit uh, below this model. So once it's completed, we can then convert the file and return the data to the 3D GIS environment. And with a bit of manipulation and alignment jiggling, we can make it fit into the rest of the data. So this is the final output for Hoxon. Uh, compared to the 3D GIS polygons we saw before, this looks much more realistic and we now have a basis to analyze the experiences within it. So as I mentioned, I am researching both Prospect and Promenade, and I have undertaken this using two different GIS tools. So to start with the Prospect and the stationary viewpoint, I used an ArcGIS tool called Viewshed Analysis to generate the visibility of the landscape from a particular location. So viewshed analysis relies on the topographical data to calculate visibility, hence the DSM data we've created. So alongside the models I've created for my PhD, I've also done additional 2D viewshed analyses from other sites that have some kind of relationship to my case studies. So for example, Oxborough Hall in Norfolk has a similar gatehouse design to that of Hoxon Hall. And so this is an example of what a view shed analysis looks like from the top of the gatehouse at Oxborough. So everything in the lighter yellow areas are visible and everything in the dark areas are invisible. Um, so the view shed results can be overlaid onto the 3D GIS environment for analysis. The software isn't perfect. And so the accuracy of the view shed is dependent on the accuracy of the LiDAR. So because we're only using two meter accuracy LiDAR, the overlay onto the models, which are more intricate, um, could not really be replicated. So as a workaround, I did spend some time doing some photo editing so that the view shed data could be more accurately visible within the 3D environment. Um, there is one metered LiDAR data available, but the regional coverage of that is even worse, so I decided not to use it. 
Um, but nevertheless, this helped visualize what was visible and what was invisible and what had a significant bearing on the experience within the 3D GIS environment. And as for the promenades, these were recreated using animations. So in this example at Stiffkey Old Hall, we can see what was in the foreground, the middle ground, and the background of the views from each location. They traveled along a route uh, called the Terrace Walk within the main gardens. So we can see the details of the models themselves. We can appreciate what contemporaries were viewing um, in terms of the features, what was prominent, what was hidden, any intricacies, particular showstoppers, um, but ultimately recognize what landowners intended to experience within quite an active process. So now we have some data to work with, we can now analyze and interpret the data. Um, so if we are to understand what was experienced through site, we need to recreate, recreate the minds of the landowners who created them. And I've used reception theory primarily for this. So reception theory is a term used by literary historians involving how printed texts affect thoughts and the behaviors of people, which expands to how their achievements, contributions, and skills were based on their own individual reaction to the text that they specifically read or created themselves. But I'm not just talking about factual or theoretical texts, but also literary works like poems and plays. As previously touched upon, this also extends into art history and looking at paintings and other artworks that hold clues about what they owned, liked and disliked, and wish to put on display for others to see. So instead of critiquing the sources themselves, I'm using them to help ascertain what landowners were inspired by and what they really thought about social, economic, political, and cultural ideas. And then coupled with a phenomenological approach by adopting this first person perspective within 3D GIS, um, we can interpret what was experienced or intended to be experienced within these landscapes. So before diving into the results themselves, there are certain locations worth identifying within the landscape from which to conduct these analysis from. So in this period, there were many locations to enjoy a prospect or promenade. We have the Piano Nobile, the first floor level with an elevation um, within the house, likely with large windows uh, where people could enjoy a view from, uh, such as the gallery at Stiffkey Old Hall. As previously shown, there were also gatehouses that towered above the rest of the estate and likely provided ample opportunity to survey the surrounding area. As well as terrace walks, there were other great feats of earth moving, such as viewing mounts that were specifically made to provide an elevated view within the, within the grounds. Um, garden buildings in the form of banqueting houses or various seats were also popular. And if the estate was lucky enough to come with parkland, then buildings within the park, such as lodges and hunting towers, was all, would also have served a similar purpose. And then, of course, before you actually get to the estate, the approach leading up to the estate provides the first glimpse of these design landscapes and sets the scene for visitors as they arrive. So I'll start sharing uh, just a small sample of some of the results that I have found. So as I previously said, I cannot access the data from my master's degree. So I am gonna focus on uh, my PhD. Um, so I've decided to go by case study uh, rather than mixing and matching between the two. So I'll start with Stifke. So Stifke was originally a medieval estate and the original entrance to the estate was to the north along the central road through the village. But contemporaries in the 16th and 17th century, however, would have considered this to be quite encroaching and unfashionable. And so when the Bacon family adopted the estate, they changed the route of the, of the approach. So the estate is very long and thin, and so they decided to run the approach along the estate's longest axis uh, from west to east. So using geometry and lines of perspective that was fashionable at the time, the Bacons used this technique to their advantage. So within the stills of the animation, you can see how the estate looked deceptively grander and more impressive than it really was upon first glance. Within contemporary literature, an Italian architect, Alberti, had advised that private ways ought to be spacious and open and free and clear of all manner of impediments, so man could see all about him. 
Francis Bacon, and who is Nathaniel's half-brother, uh, is also a notable writer during this period, and he described how there was nothing more pleasing to the eye than green grass. So judging from this new approach at Stiffkey, uh, the rest of the Bacon family agreed. So not only was the approach moved away from the encroaching village road, but also by demolishing houses on the ridge, as captured on the aerial photography and LIDAR previously, um, these areas would have been visible from the approach had it not been for them demolishing them. And so the grassland was then expanded to create a much more visually appealing uh, view along the approach. So another reason I chose to look at Stiffkey was because the Bacons had originally designed a very different house for Stiffkey that never came to fruition. So in 1573, a plan for Stiffkey shows that the house was intended to be a courtyard house with a large gallery along the entire length of the South Wing. However, by 1579, when Nathaniel's father died and he received only a small inheritance, Nathaniel decided this was not a financially viable option anymore, and so it was never built. So instead, only three wings were built, and the gallery was built in 1580, and there has been much speculation about where it was built in the house, but from my own judgments based on uh, various sources and various works of other researchers, the most plausible option given within the time of construction is placing the gallery within the north wing of the house with a single window looking westward. So thanks to GIS, uh, we can not only recreate what was, but also, well, what was and what had existed, but also what could have been and what landowners had originally envisioned. So by being able to switch the layers on and off, we can show both concurrently. Um, so it's interesting to see how different the views are compared to both of these gallery locations. Um, so from the intended gallery, um, there was intended to be warmth from the southern sun, and people would have enjoyed views focused on the pasture and meadowland within close proximity of the house. And the valley ridge prevented most views of farmland beyond that point, and only within the peripheries could the village and landscape beyond be visible, but not at all prominent. But from the actual gallery to the north, all these features that would have been hidden from the intended gallery were then brought into focus and more extensively visible. So the view from the actual gallery also included service buildings immediately beneath the window on the west side that would not have been considered desirable. So based on the previous discussion of open green spaces experience within the approach, it still would have been true had the intended gallery been built, but the actual gallery would not have lived up to these expectations and that evidently shows that this was a compromise due to financial is issues rather than it being Nathaniel's choice. And then I shall move to the banqueting house and terrace walk. Um, so I've used both view shed and animations for this bit. So as Henry Wooten described, having a high walk providing the first access to the garden from which landscape views could be enjoyed was a popular concept in this period. Coupled with a banqueting house at its eastern terminus, this combination of banqueting house and terrace is something we also see at Blickling Hall. So the style of the banqueting house upon the terrace would have followed Italianate fashions with ornate designs, geometric shapes, and this octagonal design is also similar to the octagon banqueting house at Hunt Stanton Hall, which is just a bit further along the North Norfolk coast from Stiffkey. So from the results, it became evident how these vantage points provided a private place not overlooked by anyone while still enjoying views over extensive grassland um, that the Bacons evidently desired. So within the gardens themselves, the view shed highlighted that the main garden was visible within the middle terrace, but the lower terrace below, which likely contained a bowling green, was hidden. This did not indicate that the bowling green wasn't desirable to view, but simply the slope of the valley and the projection of the terrace required to meet certain geometric proportions just happened to result in that. Nonetheless, this worked in the Bacon's favour by providing a place for visitors to just happen upon as they wandered through the garden, thus 
working with those fashionable expectations of exploration and discovery in this period. So the estate accounts indicate that within this garden, there were fragrant herbs like rosemary planted, which would have been um, added, which would have added to that um, experience um, with the smells and odors. Um, the garden was also adorned with black and white colors, which were the heraldic colors of the Bacon family, which would therefore initially suggest that the garden provided a display of power, lineage and status. However, I personally believe that there is another more sentimental and romantic reason behind this garden. So Nathaniel Bacon married Anne Gresham after Nathaniel refused to marry any other woman that his father threw at him and they had five children together. All of this indicates that it was a romantic rather than an advantageous match. And sadly, she died just as the gardens were being created. And in the same year as her death, Nathaniel planted the rosemary, which in Shakespeare's tragedy, Hamlet was a symbol of remembrance. But also the colors of black and white were also Anne Gresham's family colors and heraldry, uh, which could equally be seen as this symbol of remembrance. So whilst this garden could have been experienced as a powerful familial display, I think in reality, given how private and secluded the garden was, the experience of it was more focused on romance, remembrance and contemplation. So I'll move on to Morsham Hall, uh, which is now completely destroyed, but was the main residence of the Marmay family. Um, Morsham was much grander and a more prosperous estate than Stiffkey, which hosted royalty, and therefore there are likely very different visual exp experiences intended here. So starting with the approach again, which started to the north of the estate nearest Chelmsford, it circled around to enter the main residence and gardens from the east. Similar to the Bacons, the Marmays prolonged the length of the approach to maximize the visual experience en route to the house. However, Molsham differed because its topographical situation was much flatter than the Valley of Stiffkey, which meant that a greater extent of the surrounding landscape would have been visible, which worked in their favour since they owned quite a considerable estate with many features worth showing off. So at the top, various enclosed fields symbolised the Mardmay's power in, accomplish in accomplishing this scale of land consolidation. And at the bottom near the house was the deer park with hunting tower dove and dovecote visible from the approach, together with rectangular fish ponds, which were in the east of the estate, which are visible on the map. Uh, these features collectively emphasised this concept of man's power over nature. Man versus nature was a very popular concept, whereby landowners showed dominance over the landscape and the animals within it by displaying how they controlled and contained those animals, which contemporaries then thought impressive. So the Marmays clearly desired to display that concept themselves and create that impression of power to their guests. Another interesting viewing concept crops up later in the approach animation. And this demonstrates the usefulness of creating these animations by showing how this immersive recreation in the first place helps capture views that you probably wouldn't have known existed. So archways dotted throughout the Molsham estate and many were visible along the approach once inside the estate. However, it is the views they captured through those archways that are amazing to see and no map could really help comprehend. So this draws on a concept of a clairvoy in this period, which is shown in Inigo Jones's stage design that I showed earlier, uh, where framing a prospect within an archway intrigues those wandering past them and encourages them to explore what lies beyond. So at Morsham, they capture the main door of a house, the parterre garden and an area of parkland looking towards the town of Chelmsford beyond. So what this could imply about the Mardmay family is that they were inspired by theatrical productions like Inigo Jones's work when creating these entertaining experiences throughout their estate. And we can corroborate this because Thomas Mildmay's marriage to Francis Radcliffe in 1566 was actually a mask oration, which is a kind of theatrical event which happened in front of the Queen. They also greeted a renowned actor, Will Kemp, and his theatre troupe to Chelmsford, and a relative of Thomas Mildmay, or Mildmay, called 
Milda May Fain, uh, wrote masks as well. So we can glean that the mild maze intended for the Morsham estate to be experienced with theatrics in mind. And there is actually another vantage point in this estate, which also supports this theory. So in the very corner of the orchard come wilderness was likely a viewing mount, which similarly existed at Blickling. Uh, viewing mounts were great feats of landscape architecture that tended to include a spiral descent leading to a platform from which to enjoy the view from at its summit. So simply the act of exploring the orchard to seek out the viewing mount would have added to the entertaining experience within Morsham. Uh, but then the mount itself would have been used for feasts and other forms of entertainment. So this experience was made greater by the view from the mount itself. So in a 17th century play called Arnaldo, uh, Brussoni uh, described a landscape that quite closely resembles the view from the Mount at Morsham. So he wrote that I came into a place that had an ascent from which there represented itself to my eye, the prospect of a great plain in the, thorm, in the form of an artificial theater which encircled on every side by the forest, dignified its center with a stately palace. So the view from the mount does overlook the palace at its center. There are trees and forests certainly within direct view to the south of the mount, and also the scale of visibility and the circular composition of that view across the grassy plains around Morsham does bring to mind this theatrical stage that Brussoni describes. It kind of looks like an amphitheater, if you will. So for an estate that has hosted royalty, it is certainly important for the Mardmay family in particular to have an estate that would engage such, a, such esteemed guests through entertainment, while also displaying their status and worth among the higher ranks of society. Having such a theatrical stage to display their estate and, viewing, and a viewing platform from which to oversee it would have been a top priority for the Mardmays. And then Hoxon Hall, um, like Morsham Hall, no longer exists in the landscape. However, this estate differs from Stifke and Morsham because Hoxon Hall was originally a medieval bishop's palace that was seized during the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII and given to the Southwell family. As a result, much of the medieval palace was incorporated into the design of Hoxon Hall which provides a new set of challenges for this research because we now need to determine whether the experiences within the Hoxton were created by the medieval bishops or by the Southwells later. So we'll start with the gatehouse, uh, which was likely retained from the bishop's palace. So despite all the crenellations in the other buildings harking back to the medieval era, the gatehouse was far more ornamental in style and then upon its roof, you'll notice a giant goat statue, uh, which was instated by the Southwell family as the heraldic beast. So the towering presence of the gatehouse as a whole was not only commanding and authoritative in nature that the medieval bishops would likely have desired, but for the Southwells adding the goat upon it, the gatehouse became their symbol of triumph in claiming the bishop's palace. As for the view from its rooftop, the view was certainly expansive and just proves why the size of this 3D GIS recreation was necessary. The bishops and then the South Wales would have been able to oversee much of the land that they owned and claimed respectively. Within the immediate grounds of the estate, the South Wales would have taken the opportunity to observe the geometric layout of the grounds that were likely created initially by the bishops. It nonetheless was retained as it was adopted um, one of those fashionable geometric styles that contemporaries like the Bacon family also recognized. Further into the landscape, however, even the most expansive view was not intruded upon by a neighboring estate called Brimhall. So despite its own impressive size, the estate of Brimhall rarely featured in the view. The woodland at Brim maintained enough privacy for the residing family at both estates to ensure they did not mutually interfere with each other's visual experiences. From the house itself, I used 3 dgis to recreate the views from all sides of the house. This was because we have no actual evidence in the terms of what the floor plan of this house was, and therefore where any of the main rooms likely resided. 
Therefore, by establishing the views from each range, we could help determine where the South Wales likely situated those rooms based on desirable properties within the landscape compositions visible from them. So from these analyses, we can safely assume that the main rooms did not um, reside in the West Front, um, which the, um, in the bottom left-hand corner, um, so the service buildings encroached quite um, a lot onto the view. And the extent of the view just feels very hindered, not in a secluded way, but in an obstructive one. And beyond was the river with an area of Fenland and a rabbit warren that didn't actually belong to the South Wales, but it belonged to the Cornwallises at Brimhall. So despite there being an orchard and a dovecote that provided a hint of beauty and status within this view, it lacked that impact that ultimately would not have been considered appropriate to view from any of the important rooms. So that leaves the east, south and north facing rooms. Uh, the north facing rooms had the most benefit from the main parterre garden, the designs of which were generally better appreciated from an elevated vantage point. The orchard was also designed in a cancunx or a five spot design, which would also be better appreciated from this height. It also overlooked the river and into the park, which collectively fit all the beautiful elements of a landscape composition that contemporaries sought. So we could presume that a gallery or other similar principal rooms resided here. The east front did have the best vantage point for enjoying the architecture of the gatehouse from an elevated vantage point, but the wings of the house coupled with the towering gatehouse did restrict this view significantly. And so it was unlikely that a gallery or a great important room resided there, perhaps maybe smaller reception rooms, something like that. As for the south front, there were views over the parkland which were extensive with enough grassland to enjoy, yet the garden directly beneath the windows was likely a kitchen garden, which did not necessarily have that visual or even odour appeal uh, compared to a formal garden like the parterre full of flowers, etc. So similarly to the east front, there may be some smaller receptions, but it may even be just bedrooms resided uh, in this wing. And then to end on, I shall look at the garden building within the parterre garden, which was almost certainly added by the South Wales, given its architectural style that resembled other buildings of the period. This particular analysis demonstrates the usefulness of this technique in that the view to the analysis actually picked up two particular locations that were visible along a single line of sight called a vista. So the blue line shows a vista to a park building called the Lodge, situated within the medieval deer park that was once owned by the bishops. So the vista itself aligned with the axes of the garden going perpendicularly across the boundary between the orchard and the parterre, over the moat and the river and into the parkland to where the lodge is. So these watery breaks in the landscape would have segregated the formal gardens from the untamed parkland, yet the view established this relationship between the garden building and the lodge. So the lodge was almost certainly original to the medieval deer park owned by the bishops. So whilst used as a hunting lodge for the deer back then, under the south walls, uh, the park instead contained cattle. So for many landowners, like the Hobarts at Blickling, the Strangers at Hunstanton, the Mild Maze at Malsham, uh, the deer park remained in use. And so for the South Wales to not do the same showed a very different perspective. So the lodge likely served as a place to retreat to and have some kind of privacy rather than serving its function as um, um, a hunting lodge. So the fact that this garden building uh, has this view, it probably inspired visitors to go and explore this area of parkland from that location. So the purple line shows another vista terminated at the parish church. So had this been the South Wales ancestral home, the church could have had more significance as a hark back to their ancestry, where their family was buried, and the lineage could have been displayed there as well. But this was the South Wales second home, and so no family was buried there, and so this interpretation was quite unlikely. 
The religious aspect is also unlikely, given the Southwell's role in the dissolution, but also Robert Southwell, um, his religious position was considered flexible, as he was involved in heresy investigations under Edward VI, who was a Protestant, and then did the same with Queen Mary, who was Catholic. So the more likely situation was simply an aesthetic and perhaps an intellectual one. So in the travel diaries of Fines Morrison in 1617, a view of a church upon a hill offered a fair prospect that promised great magnificence in the building. So capturing a church within a landscape view was desirable and is also seen in artistic works across the period, especially in the works of Dutch or Flemish painters depicting landscapes both at home and abroad. So to be able to see this kind of view within a landscape that no longer exists and at a site we know very little about is quite exciting to see. So I have blasted through all of that and I wish I could delve more deeply into the case studies to tell you more about what I learned, but I hope that what I've been able to show today has provided you with a good idea of what is possible with this technique and perhaps inspire future research. So just to conclude, I hope I've demonstrated the benefits of using a multidisciplinary approach and in using technology to help achieve work with what limited evidence we have about this period. I hope that I've shown how to create a new, a powerful source using both 3D representation and GIS analytical tools, which can be adapted based on the scope of research involved and also the technical ability of those who wish to use it. And I hope this research provides a better understanding of the visual experience within design landscapes that others can appreciate and use to support their own research and conclusions. So I've just left the titles of my master's dissertation, my PhD thesis, and the article about my work. So if you wish to look into it further, um, but for now, thanks for listening. <laughs>